but from a very elis elitist point of view, for the normal everyday person from within the Gulf region, they're trying to figure out why do I need insurance? They s this is not being this is not registering in their head. No one is telling them why they need insurance. Perhaps take that this, to, to come back on that point in, uh, as an example. In Oman, pre Ganu, which was the big cyclone that hit, I believe the insurance coverage on housing and so on was something like 10 percent. After it, it went to 50 percent. And when the recent storm happened this year, uh, so. I suppose why they they got a they got an answer to that question. The absence of it became obvious. Until that is there, then maybe. But but again, uh, it's it takes a while to register in their heads because at most people's point of view is that um, I have a government whose responsibility is to cover me. So why on earth would I have to go out and do it when somebody else is supposed to do that for me? This is that's what I'm saying. There's a split when you're talking about expatriate population who have who know very clearly there's no one who's going to support me. Uh, my government, no matter how much I put in the pension funds, hey, if there's a pension fund for me to, when I retire, I'm very happy. But in this part of the world, the idea is, you know what, don't worry, that's what, I, well, that's what we're here for. We're here to protect you, for, to ensure that whatever you want is provided and supported at one point or another. Maybe not equally, but that's the idea. It's becoming slowly, and it, it's not showing at this point, but it's slowly becoming a, a mathematical burden that people are not willing. You know what? If you're used to eating caviar, and there's just one of you, and you get married, and you e you're still eating caviar with your wife, it's still fine. Uh, you might be eating less, but when you have a kid, and you treat the, treat the kid to eat caviar as well, you're still, all three of you are indulging in it. Now you go to his his child, and then his child, and then his child, and the amount of caviar you start eating becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. When, the, when does it reach the point where you start saying, you know what, uh, we'll eat uh, salmon caviar rather than sturgeon's caviar, and so on and so forth. The, uh, the idea is that it takes a while for this to register, but when you start talking about a population that so far is minuscule, relatively speaking, mm. it doesn't really matter because the income is there to cover it. We, we should see this becoming a major problem in this part of the world, not now. 50 years down the road, maybe 100 years, well, I have no idea, I won't be alive, I hope. But um, down the road, that's what the kind of group will, well, I, I inshallah. Uh, is that p the point of the cradle to the kind of support, while admirable and, and nice to have, obviously, does it, is it worth reconsidering it also because maybe it contributes to le you know, poor habits in terms of performance and uh, drive for uh, being a, mo a more dynamic economic contribution, if you like? It is, it, although the money's there, we can pay it, why not? But it, it, does it contribute to less beneficial habits? Um, here's a small example. I give this in family businesses, uh, but I think it's appropriate in this, in this point. You have a, 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 f uh, an a, par a parent with two children, one bright and intelligent, the other one le <laughs> less bright and intelligent. Right? If you treat them equally, what you do is you pull away the motivation for the bright and intelligent person to exceed, uh, to, to exceed and excel, and you give a false thought to the one who's less intelligent that he or she is capable of being on par with his or her brother, right? What happens when you do that on a large scale? Because that's exactly what, what you're asking. This is what happens. I'm taking away the drive, the motivation from a person. The, the point that when we were discussing at our table, we were talking about the issue of um, whether uh, uh, if my uh, my government sorry if governments are willing to uh, take care of everything, support everything. Well, where, where does the motivation for the child, i.e., can he he or she be able to compete in international levels? But that's what I'm doing from an economic point of view, seriously. And I know and oh God, please, if this ever goes out, I'm going to be in a lot of problems. But seriously, if you want to test out to see how good a company is, regionally. See how successful they are externally, outside of their comfort zone. If outside of their comfort zone they're still successful, that's a successful sign. But how many of them are here? That's the question I'll leave up hanging. We're going to go to the floor now, so if anybody has some thoughts, please uh, gather them. Um, Jeff, I might just uh, go to you on the, the, 
back to the original statistic of 87% no idea what retirement would look like. And so, is the fact that the absence of a tax burden here does that restrict the the development of a retirement plan, or, or, or as given that in other markets generally pensions are looked as a tax efficient vehicle to save? Well, I think it, I think it, it does in some respects. I mean, th but the point is, if there's no tax anyway, then it, you know you can't really incent with tax relief. So the two go hand in hand. They have to be <laughs> two sides of the same coin. Um, so yes, in 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 Western and and other economies. It is ta a tax relievable expense both for the employer, you know, which is an advantage, and certainly for the individual. That ev even that benefit is starting to be eroded, and often you'll find actually the benefits are really about deferred taxation. So if you look in most Western economies, you do get tax relief up front, but you pay tax on the benefit when the pension comes out later. Uh, so the actual value of that is less clear. But certainly it's an incentive if the structure is such that you're penalized for taking income, then certainly you'll do that. I wanted to make one other point, which comes back to the, the thing about variable pay. You know, I mean, uh, so, someone that, that is, it has performance-related elements to their pay and bonuses can make a choice to, to increase the funding of their pension. They're rewarded through shares and other aspects. This comes back to the point about education. Uh, Citibank is a good example of this. Three years ago, an, ex uh, an executive I know at Citibank uh, was sitting on shares maybe valued at three million. Today, there may be 200,000. That person thought they had a very secure retirement. Now they don't. So the question is, you know, wh what do you need to do to educate yourself about the potential financial shocks of the future? Many people use property for their pension and retirement. Again, you know, we know that property moves in, in a cyclical way. You know, the sequence it's a diplomatic of, way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we know that, that it matters to you. When, you. when you're accumulating, when you're saving for retirement, it doesn't matter to you the sequence of, of booms and busts, but it absolutely does matter at the point of retirement when you, ha when you have all these assets in terms of what's going on cyclically and how you're going to use those assets for retirement. So this is where education and planning are absolutely vital. Anybody from the floor yet? Uh, Diala at the back, Can I start who's with a near question? retirement. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the choices of how people may plan and what they're saving for and they're accumulating assets. And that's one thing to take on board, and we, there's probably plenty of advice out there as how to do it. Um, I think we have a f couple of lawyers in the room, and I want to just to address the legal aspect of it, of, of us living here, people sitting here planning their future, saving, accumulating assets. And there always seems to be a bit of a gray area over how secure those assets are and what will happen if something happens to me or my um, partner. And, and whenever I ask a lawyer, they seem to have to go and refer to their notes. Will they give me a straight answer? So how does that affect your business, Jeff, in terms of when you're giving advice to people? And I'm wondering if any lawyers can shed some light on that.